Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to continue our study of the minor prophets in our survey of the Old Testament. We come now to the book of Obadiah, which contains the oracle against Edom. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 1 starts off, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us go against her for battle. Edom was located south of Judah. This is that area south of the Dead Sea, between the Dead Sea and the Red Sea to the south, is the land of Edom. It's a dry desert area. Uh, it extends far below sea level and then rises as you go down toward, toward the, the Gulf of Aqaba to the south. Verse 3 says, The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. One of the striking places you go to in Edom is an area today known as Petra. You go through some narrow clefts in these giant rocks. You finally find yourself, after about a, a half a mile's walk, coming out. And there is a huge city which was there in Edom's day, although it didn't have all of the same structure that is there today. Today you come out and you see what, what's known as the treasury. This was built quite a bit later, but the city was already inhabited in Edom's day. It's a, a vast network. And you can imagine this city which is so well protected in the clefts of the rock. Now why is God bringing something against Edom? It is because, verse 10, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. What had happened, Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, was being taken away into captivity and Edom had said, oh good, we can jump in and we can persecute them too. And God says, no, I'm doing that. You keep your hands off. So some lessons that we see from this short little one-chapter book of Obadiah. First of all, God cares for his people when they suffer. Secondly, we see in this book that God warns but will eventually judge those who persecute his people. And thirdly, we see that God will give victory to his people one day. At the end of the story, God's faithful people will inherit the kingdom of God in its fullness. Next, we're going to look at the book of Jonah. When we think of Jonah, oftentimes we think of a prophet who went for a submarine ride in a, in a fish. But there's much more to the book than that. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh was located far afield in the land of Mesopotamia along the banks of the Tigris River. And Jonah doesn't want to go, not because he's afraid of Assyria, but because Assyria has been the traditional enemy of Israel and of Judah. Remember, Israel is going to be eventually taken away into captivity at the hands of the Assyrians. The Assyrians after that will come up against Judah and seek to do the same thing to them. And so and so Jonah goes down to Tarshish. He rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish. That, that's in the opposite direction. Paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. As if you could really escape the presence of the Lord by going anywhere on the face of the earth. So he heads to Tarshish, what we call modern day Spain as far removed as you can be from Assyria as humanly possible. 
you know that it doesn't work. And here's a, 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 an easy outline of the book of Jonah. Chapter 1, we could call him the reluctant prophet. Chapter 2, I'm referring to him sort of laughingly as the, the one that got away. That's, that's Jonah in the belly of the, the fish because what happens, he is taken by, uh, he, the, the ship runs into a storm and the sailors cannot get out of it. And Jonah tells the sailors, the only way you can get out of it is get me off the ship. And they throw him into the ocean where he swallowed uh, he is swallowed by a fish. But he comes back again in chapter 3. I, I refer to that as the city that turned back to God because Jonah comes to Nineveh. He preaches to them. And in chapter 4, we see Jonah, a man on fire for God. Uh, so the, the, the outline of this book, we could say uh, geographically, in chapter 1, he's in the ship. In chapter 2, he's in the fish. In chapter 3, he is in Nineveh. And then in chapter 4, he is outside of Nineveh. If we look at the, the heart of the prophet, we see chapter 1, the prodigal prophet, chapter 2, the praying prophet, chapter 3, the preaching prophet, and finally chapter 4, the pouting prophet. Well, in chapter 2, God uh, causes, J J God hears Jonah's prayer, and the fish vomits up Jonah up onto dry land, and then in chapter 3, verse 1, God comes to Jonah a second time, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. And this time Jonah goes. Jonah gets there, chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a, a city of three days walk. We're not sure in entirely what that means, but it seems to be a, a way of describing the, the greatness, the largeness of the city of Nineveh. That phrase, an exceeding great city, literally it's a great city to God, but the, the point isn't that this was a, uh, a city that was given over to God. That seems to be a phrase describing its greatness. It's, it's almost, I want to say godliness, not in the sense that they were godly, but in how big they were how great the city was. NIV translates that now Nineveh was a very important city, a city required three days. Perhaps that's a, that's a better translation as far as getting the idea of the, of the Hebrew phrasing across. The good news about Nineveh is that they hear the preaching of Jonah. Jonah says three days from now, or 40 days from now, the city's going to be destroyed, and they repent when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God, he also repents. He relented concerning the calamity which he had declared that he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. So you come to the end of 40 days, and instead of Nineveh being destroyed, Nineveh survives. It continues into the 41st and 42nd, 43rd day very nicely. And we want to say, oh, that's wonderful. And everybody says, that's wonderful. Except Jonah who says, no, that's not wonderful. Chapter 4, verse 1, it, but it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Why did he become angry? We're told in the next verse. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relented concerning calamity. And I didn't want you to resort to relent concerning calamity. I wanted you to bring calamity upon the city of Nineveh because I don't like the city of Nineveh. Therefore, now, O Lord, verse 3, take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Isn't it great that God doesn't answer some of our stupid prayers? Uh, just, just recently, I, I prayed something that wasn't very smart, and, and God didn't answer it, and I, I'm so delighted. Uh, and I, I went back afterwards and confessed, boy, that was a dumb prayer, Lord, forgive me. Uh, and, and sometimes in grace, God does not answer some of our prayers. We get, get to verse 8, and God wants to teach Jonah a lesson. And so Jonah has camped outside the city, waiting, hoping still that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And verse 8, when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. And, and again, you can sort of picture Jonah uh, uh, praying a prayer that, that God doesn't answer. 
And God had given a plant to Jonah to give him some shade, but then he had sent a worm to eat the plant. And, and Jonah's so upset about the plant and the worm and things like that. And, and the book ends, then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on, the, on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. The book ends on this note with a question. And of course that begs the question, why does the book of Jonah end this way? It doesn't tell us what happened to Jonah. It doesn't tell us did he eventually die? Did he eventually repent? What happened to Jonah? We're not told that. Instead, the book ends with that question. And the point of it is that we're supposed to ask the same question ourselves. We are supposed to ask, am I going to have a heart like Jonah, sort of a silly heart, a self-centered heart, or am I going to have a heart like God, who is compassionate for others, even those nasty old Gentiles? Some lessons from the book of Jonah. First of all, God wants repentance. We see that he wants repentance in the people of Nineveh. He also wants repentance in the heart of his crusty old prophet Jonah. In Nineveh, he wants repentance. In Jonah, he wants repentance. And God is a God of compassion. His compassion extends to both pagan cities as well as to stubborn prophets. I love that about the Lord because that means his compassion extends to me as well. Next, we want to look at the book of Micah. The book of Micah starts off the word of the Lord, which came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. This is in the closing days of Samaria. Samaria has not long to be there. By the time we get to Hezekiah, Samaria will be taken away into captivity and will be no more. The book of Micah consists of three oracles, and each one follows the same general pattern. In the first oracle, we see judgment of idolatry, and then that's followed by promise, a promise of eventual regathering. Likewise, in the second oracle, there is a judgment, this time against the rulers, and there is a promise of future glory. In the third oracle, you can almost see which way it's going to go. There is a judgment, this time against disloyalty, and a promise of future resurrection. So there is both judgment, promise, judgment, promise, judgment, promise, all throughout this book. Verse 6, he, Micah says, For I will make Samaria, and actually it's the Lord speaking, a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley and will lay bare her foundations. Her, all of her idols will be smashed. All of her earrings will be burned with fire. All of her image I will make desolate, for she can collected them from a harlot's earnings, and to the earrings of a harlot they will return. This was graphically fulfilled. You can go to the location where Samaria once stood. It is still a ruin. It is still just a heap of stones which, into which it was turned in that day in the year 721 B.C. We get to verse 10, and the prophet says, Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. Now when we hear that phrase, it's a little like hearing... For example, if I said, by the dawn's early light, and you might say, wait a minute, that's a part of a familiar song. That's part of the Star Spangled Banner. Likewise, when we hear the phrase, tell it not in Geth, weep not at all, that's a reminder, that's a part of a song that had been sung long earlier, way back in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, where David had sung the song at the death of Saul and Jonathan, David had sung, Your beauty, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. And he borrows a phrase from that to let you know this is a lament. This is a musical lament. And so here in Micah, chapter 1, verse 10, Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. At Beth Laafra, roll your, which actually Beth Laafra means uh, house of dust, 
roll yourself in the dust. So what we're going to see here is an entire series of word plays. Now we're not going to be going through all of them right now in our survey. But I like the way that two scholars have, have sort of rendered this into English, taking the names and changing them, but changing them into what they actually mean. And you get a sense of it in their little poem. Let's read it. Tell it not in Tellington. Wail not in Wailing. Dust Manor will eat dirt. Dressy Town will flee naked. Safe Hold will not save. All Chester's walls are down. A bitter dose drinks bitter tongue. Toward Jerusalem, remember that means city of peace, toward Jerusalem, city of peace, the Lord sends war. Harness the war steeds, O men of Barsteed. Zion's beginning of sinning equal to Israel's crimes. To welfare a last farewell for trapping trapped Israel's king. Now, like I said, uh, the names are changed to get more the meaning of them and to get a sense of the rhyming. When you see rhymes in Hebrew, that's not normal in poetry. When you see rhymes in Hebrew, it is by way of a pun, and there are a whole series of them in this chapter. We come to chapter 4, verse 1, and it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and people, the peoples will stream to it. Notice this mountain theme. It takes us back to the mountain of God that is described back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, where, God, where Moses first meets God by what, what he calls the mountain of God, and there's the burning bush, and, and later on the Israelites are brought back, after the Exodus, they're brought back to this particular mountain. In the Song of Moses, we read in Exodus 15:17. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So the idea of God's sanctuary upon a mountain is, it goes all the way back to the Song of Moses, all the way back to the book of Exodus. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 through 16, we saw there the mountain of God described in, uh, in the midst of the covering cherub. That reference, and we wonder, gee, is, is that a reference to uh, the king of Tyre? Or is that a reference to maybe the, the supernatural power behind the king of Tyre? It sounded a bit like the one we know as Satan. We continue here, Micah chapter 4, verse 2, And many nations will come to that mountain and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So uh, notice the prophecy looks to a time when not just Israel, not just the tribe of Judah, not just the Jews, but many nations would come to the, to the mountain of the house of the Lord. We get to chapter 5, verse 2, and there's a wonderful messianic prophecy here. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Who came from Bethlehem? Well, King David had come from Bethlehem. But now there's a promise of another one who will go forth, who will be, can I call it, another ruler a better ruler, a better David in Israel, whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity, whose goings forth precede David, even though he's going to come after David. He comes from the same town of David, and yet his days were from the days of eternity. That's a call for the Messiah. Chapter 6, verse 6, But with what shall I come to the Lord, the prophet asks, and bow myself before the before the God on high. Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What does God want from us? 
here it is. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. God always calls for this from his people. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before your God. We get next to the prophet Nahum. And the prophet Nahum, again, in one of those shorter prophets, this is the prophet of Nineveh's destruction. You say, wait, wait a minute, Jonah was a prophet of Nineveh's destruction, but remember Nineveh was saved during that time because of their repentance. Nahum now writes quite a number of years later, about 150 years later, and this time Nineveh will be destroyed. It reminds me of a... a street sign, a billboard that, that was seen after a certain hurricane had come through South Florida and had ravaged South Florida and had ripped off the sign. And behind that sign was an older sign and it said, notice, we need to talk God. There's a little bit of that here in the book of Nahum. You see, Nahum reminds us of the book of Jonah because both Nahum and Jonah focus upon Assyria and their capital city of Nineveh. Both Nahum and Jonah contain prophecies of Nineveh's destruction. Both Nahum and Jonah close their books with a question, two different questions, but they are both asking questions at the end. And the book of Nahum means comfort, and you say, is the city of Nineveh going to find comfort here? No, they're going to find judgment. But the enemies of Assyria, the enemies of Nineveh, Nineveh, God's people who were taken into captivity by Nineveh, they are going to find comfort in this book. Notice the play on words when we get to Nahum chapter 3 verse 7, and it will come about that all who see you, speaking to the, the city of Nineveh, will shrink from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will grieve for her? Where will I seek Naham? Where will I seek comforters for you? It's a play on words on the name of Nahum, ne well, the prophet that we know as Nahum. In the book of Habakkuk, this is a book now of prayer and praise. Habakkuk is going to ask a question in, his, in the prayer section of his book. And the question that he asks is, why does God allow the wicked to go unpunished? The answer that we're going to see God answers Habakkuk and says, I'm going to judge the wicked. I'm going to bring judgment upon the wicked. So uh, that's the answer to your question. It will not indefinitely go. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6, God says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetus, uh, or impetuous people who march throughout the earth, who seize dwelling places which are not theirs. And sure enough, that's going to be fulfilled. Not from Nineveh, they've, they've long since been destroyed, but now from Babylon, who will come against the land of Judah. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves. In the evening, their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour and so notice Habakkuk's problem. He had asked the question, why does God allow the wicked? And God had answered, well, I'm going to bring judgment and it will be the Chaldeans who come to judge. And that brings up a new problem. The new problem is how can God use the wicked to punish his people? How can God use the Chaldeans? They are worse than the Jews were. And God answers that. God says, I will also judge the Chaldeans. I will eventually ba balance all of the books. In chapter 2, verse 14, God explains, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this leads Habakkuk to praise. Uh, in chapter 3, that's a, you know, we, we saw the problem, chapters 1 and 2. In chapter 3, Habakkuk praises the Lord for the person of God. He praises him for the power of God. He praises him for the purpose of God. And he praises God because of faith in God. He is trusting in the Lord. 
chapter 3 verse 17 though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines though the yield of the olive should fail and though the fields produce no food though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls even though all these things happen Yet I will exalt in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, Habakkuk sings, and he has made my feet dwell like hinds feet, and made me walk on my high places. And then he, a little marginal notation for the choir director on my stringed instruments. It reminds me of a time, one time, when I, I was by a great canyon. Actually, it was here in the Americas. It was the Grand Canyon. And I saw a deer that was standing right on the edge of, of the precipice. And it looked like he had fallen down far away. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to fall to his death. That's so sad. And I looked away, and all of a sudden he wasn't there. And I looked down to, to see where he might be. And he was scampering about quite comfortably on high places. Even though it looked like it was tragedy, it was really a place of safety for that deer. And God makes us like that. That place that looks like such a terrifying place, he makes us secure in the midst of that. Next we come to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah is speaking of the judgment against the land of Judah. Zephaniah, or Zephaniah, as there's no actual Z in the word, uh, it comes from the, the Hebrew word Zaphan, to hide. And there's a, a bit of a play on words perhaps here in chapter 2, verse 3, where Zephaniah says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be Zephan, perhaps you will be hidden in the, days of the Lord, in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 1 starts off the word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah son of Cushi son of uh, Gedaliah son of Amariah son of Hezekiah in the days of Josiah son of Ammon king of Judah notice the lineage that he has it takes us all the way back to Hezekiah uh, so this here is Zephaniah he's actually of the royal family now that doesn't mean he's going to be a king he's not but he's a cousin to the king he's got a distinguished family and he's prophesying in the days of Josiah in the days of Josiah Josiah had brought about a uh, reform he had said let's go back and clean up the temple uh, they began to do that and as they were cleaning the temple they found an old scroll uh, that contained the covenant of God perhaps it was the book of Deuteronomy and they read that and they say they saw all the curses that were promised if the people would be would if they broke the covenant if they disobeyed the Lord and they thought oh my we've done all those things what shall we do uh, they went and, and called for the prophetess Hulda and Hulda said here's what you do turn to the Lord repent uh, lead the people back to the Lord and we'll see what happens and and Josiah does exactly that and Hulda says because you're going to repent uh, these judgments will not come Josiah in your day and he reigns for a good long time and the judgments do not fall in his day but they will fall after his death upon his sons and, and his grandson so the date of the writing of this book is in the days of Josiah son of Ammon king of Judah we're told that in chapter 1 verse 1 and there is that call for national repentance and we're going to see that call echoed right here in this book it's written slightly prior to the uh, to the time of Jeremiah so the the judgments that Jeremiah sees has not they have not yet started and it foretells the destruction of the city of Nineveh which, which would take place in the year 612 BC so this book is written before 612 BC So Zephaniah, he's, it's written during the days of, of Josiah, king of Judah. Notice after Josiah dies, then we will see uh, first his son Jehoahaz reign very briefly, then Jehoiakim, then his grandson Jehoiachin, and finally another one of Josiah's sons, Zedekiah. And after that, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So uh, things like Jeremiah's reign and Daniel and Ezekiel and the fall of Nineveh, these things are still future in Zephaniah's prophecy. The book is going to begin with a prophecy of the coming judgment on Jerusalem. We'll see that in the first six verses. That will be followed by uh, a coming judgment on the leaders and the wealthy in particular. 
uh, because leaders uh, and those who have money are a bit more uh, they are uh, a bit more liable uh, for leading the people next there is God's coming judgment against the nations God first promises to judge his people then he promises to judge the nations and we see in chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 and this is the pivotal section in the middle of the book this is the call to repentance after that we see God's judgment again uh, against the nations again we see a reference to God's coming judgment uh, against the leaders and the book ends not with coming judgment on Jerusalem but with a promise of coming restoration on Jerusalem that's in the closing uh, verses of the third chapter Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, notice what, he, what Zephaniah says. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O na nation, without shame. That's a, a, striking, a striking judgment against the people. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. O nation, without shame. It's shameful that you have no shame. In verse 3, he says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth. This is the language of repentance. Who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden. Remember we said this is our, our play on words because Zephaniah means hidden of the Lord. Perhaps you will be hidden in the, days, in the day of the Lord's anger. So there's a call to seek the Lord and to seek righteousness and to seek humility so that perhaps you might you might not see that coming judgment. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness against, indeed my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Notice there's a promise to gather the nations. Uh, God promises there's coming a day, yes, of judgment, but also a day of the gathering of the nations. For, to, for then I will give to the peoples, who? The nations, purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord together. Notice uh, there's a there's a, pro there's a promise. Yes, there's judgment. Yes, there's restoration. But there's coming a time when purified lips, such as we saw given to Isaiah, such as we saw given to Jeremiah. Normally we think of that to his prophets. But notice this goes to all the people that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Where else does the Bible speak of purified lips? Well, we just mentioned to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to his people, God is going to do this, but he is going to give the spirit of his word to all peoples, to many. He says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, that's about as far away as you could go and still be in the world, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. In that day, you will feel no shame. Remember, he, he had the diatribe against the, the city without shame, but in that day, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then, here, here they don't feel shame, not because they're shameless, but for then I will remove from your midst your proud exulting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. How can you feel no shame when the Lord comes and cleanses you, brings you low, and then gives you his place of refuge. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O Israel! Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem! Notice how the book ends with promise and praise. 
The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear no disaster, no more. At the end of the prophecy, there's a promise that God will dwell with you. And that will make everything fine and glorious. There's, it reminds me a bit of an old Disney cartoon. It was called The Lion King. And in the middle of the story of The Lion King, there's, there's the little lion cub and he's sort of gotten away from home. And, and three ugly looking hyenas are about to gobble him up, have him for lunch. Uh, and all of a sudden, he, he, he's going to try to make his stand. He goes, roar, and it's this little tiny roar. And all of a sudden, they look, and they become afraid, and they turn around and run away. And then in the, in the this wonderful little cartoon movie, the camera pans back, and you see not the, just the little cub by himself, but his dad, the lion, the king of beasts, is standing behind him. It's a little like what the Lord does for us. It's not that we become so great, because so that we can fear disaster no more but rather the king of israel the lord is in our midst and he roars forth and we have nothing of which to fear at that point in that day it will be said to jerusalem do not be afraid o zion do not let your hand hands fall limp the lord your god is in your midst a warrior a victorious warrior he will exult over you with joy he will be quiet in his love he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy when the lord is in your midst you can trust in him I will gather those who grieve about the appointment, appointed feasts. They will come from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. Does this remind you of somebody? It should. And I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Shame is turned to praise when the Lord comes as it, and is in our midst. The New Testament continues this theme of shame by showing the one who took our shame upon himself. Jesus Christ did that upon the cross. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the book of Hebrews says, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is, yes, our sin bearer, but he is also our shame bearer. He took our shame upon himself, even though it was hateful, even though it was despised. He did that. For the joy set before him and has won the victory for us. Now little children, 1 John chapter 2 verse 28, now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. We can trust in the Lord and when he comes there will be no shame because he took our shame upon himself. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 20, At that time I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I, will, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. <laughs> 